renovated retirement with charlie Jude. oh no i think i'm about to have another episode oh folks it is i don't know it's december no january 3rd most of the people in my family have been sick for a month i don't understand it there's a cough that will never go away but i want to record podcasts darn it i want to give you content so as freddie mercury would say in light of the recent movie, Bohemian Rhapsody, which is freaking awesome. The show must go on. It's hard to even sing because normally I can't sing. And now I have some sort of sickness going on. But you know what I'm going to do? You know what I'm going to do to work through this? I'm going to just record some podcasts. Because as the reviews say, he's wacky, but he's got good content. So I'm going to keep giving you wacky, good content while I pet my schnauzer. Tiger, do you have anything to say? He does not. He just wants me to touch him. That's cool. This is episode 125. I'm going to entitle this one using OPM rather than AUM for your LTC. Now, what does that mean? OPM is other people's money. AUM is assets under management. And LTC is long-term care. Now, long-term care is sick life in my five lives of retirement. So when I teach the five lives of retirement... All I'm really doing is creating a model or a grid or some sort of a test for you to know whether or not you have a good retirement plan, and it's a way to evaluate retirement plans that my team offers you or someone else offers you or you currently have. A good retirement plan must take good care of you and your family, whether you have a long life, short life, rough life, sick life, and if you just peacefully pass into the next life, which is estate planning. Well, the focus of this show is on sick life, or LTC, which stands for long-term care. Now, what's the problem with long-term care? What's this whole problem with sick life? Well, I'm going to go to Google right now, looking at my schnauzer. Hi, Tiger. Do you have anything to say? He does not. He just wants me to touch him. So I'm going to go to Google and just say, uh, average cost of a nursing home. Let's do that. Average cost of a nursing home, blah, blah, blah. For some reason, it says in San Diego. I don't, average cost of living in San Diego. That is nowhere near what I typed. Nursing home. Average cost of a nursing home. Let's do monthly, blah, 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 blah. The cost of assisted living nationally averages from $120 a day, 3600 a month, 43000 annually, blah, 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 blah. Usually, what you're going to find if you dig deeper, let's do average monthly cost. I do a lot of this on the podcast, by the way, live Google searches. Oh, well, Tiger doesn't have anything to say, but he will shake his Christmas bell that's hanging around his neck. Average cost, let's see. What we find mostly, when you look up the average cost of long-term care or assisted living or having someone come into your home, is roughly eight to $9,000 a month. Well, eight to nine thousand dollars a month. Oftentimes, that's more than someone's taking in income from their, you know, portfolio. So, this whole sick life issue—the fact that people don't drop dead. Most people don't die by just going. Bleh, they're just dead, right? When I'm teaching seminars, I often say most people don't die like this. And I'll walk along, fall on my back right in front of everybody, just drop to the ground and go. Bleh. They don't die like that. Most people today fade out. They have a lot of health issues, things that uh, you know are starting to stop, you know, starting to stop. Things that are stop, things that stop working in their body, or slowly disappear. Problems that show up more, 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 more. They get on medication, medication, medication. They begin to fade out. They break a hip. Their memory starts to go. Whatever it is, eventually they can't take them, take care of themselves, and they go into nursing, uh, a nursing home for care, or they have somebody come in to take care of them. Most people fade away or fade out instead of dropping dead. And the entire sick life portion of what I teach is based on this. So you guys know, you know, the title of this this, uh, podcast is using OPM, other people's money, rather than AUM, which stands for assets under management. I did a podcast on this. Um, Assets under management is just money sitting in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. Somebody's managing it for you to take care of your LTC, your long-term care. Now, Why am I saying that? Well, let's take someone who does not listen to me and listens to the Joker Brokers or Edward Morgan Lynch where they get paid, basically, to make you invest in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. 
They make you take all of the risk while they charge you a fee, and they get steady income. They get half a percent to one percent of whatever you invested with them every single year, whether they work or not, which is why most of them play golf. This is why I teach you either buy an annuity or you are an annuity. What do I mean by that? If you have a million dollars and you buy an annuity, you get guaranteed income for life every single month like a money tree. You get a paycheck. The advisor, get paid, the advisor gets paid one time and never gets paid again. If they can convince you to put your money in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, because they're going to do a diversified portfolio of large cap, small cap, international, blah, 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 and they charge you 1% or whatever they're charging you for gambling for you, what have they done? They have put all of the risk on you. They're charging fees to gamble for you. And what have they created for themselves? They have made you an annuity. Every single month, they get paid on the money they're managing for you, whether it goes up or down. They have made you an annuity. So you either buy an annuity where you get the guaranteed income for the rest of your life, or you become an annuity where someone manages your money and they get the guaranteed income every month for the rest of your life, their life, no matter what happens inside of your portfolio or until you leave them. So that's what AUM is, Assets Under Management. So I've been pretty vocal in saying I do not think AUM makes any sense for anybody. I think stocks, bonds, and mutual funds have no place, listen close, no place in a retirement plan for today's pre-retiree or retiree, I'm 46 years old, don't have a single dollar in my life in stock bonds, or mutual funds, not because I don't believe in them, but rather because from 1970 to 1999, they paid 13.5% interest compounding. But today, in the last two decades, you know nobody cares about the weather from the 70s or traffic reports from the 80s. The last two decades, the last 18 years, the market is only made about 5.5% compounding, and that is not enough for me to risk my money, and it should not be enough for you considering that annuities and life insurance have been paying 7 8 or 9%, some of them up to 11 If you work with the you know, <clears throat> illustrations that have passed compliance, they're actually, they've actually been reviewed, and they're allowed to show you this. There are certain insurance strategies policies you could have owned to grow your money tax-free that have made 10 or 11 percent if any compliance guys are choking on their fat at cheney push up your glasses and call me and i'll school you on the truth it, i don't have any problem with that if it's legal because it's true then it's legal because it's true guys hello so I don't have any money in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. I really don't think anybody should right now. I understand that some people are junkies. They slap their wrist and or slap their arm and hope to pop the veins and say, I need another hit. They need the stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. And that's fine as long as you're investing with the money you don't need for retirement income. But let me just talk in this short episode about ways to cover long-term care that are a little bit different than you may have thought of. Because the traditional, I'm going to put every dollar in my life in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. So let's say you've saved a million bucks. Most people haven't. But let's say you saved a million dollars and you're taking $50,000 a year out of it and it's all in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. You have it invested with some Edward Morgan Lynch advisor who's, you know, blah, blah, blah. They're diversifying and they're, they're lying to you and scamming you, whatever. You have it invested in things that might go up things that might go down, and you're taking $50,000 a year, which, by the way, $50,000 a year off of a million-dollar portfolio is almost twice the safe level to take out of a portfolio. All of the experts have now said 2.8% maybe you run out of money on the day you die. So you could take $28,000 a year pre-tax. If you're taking $50,000 a year, that's almost double what people say you should do, which is why surprise surprise which is why i don't suggest people leave money in stocks bonds and mutual funds while they're taking an income ding 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 genius alert should you really be taking twice the amount out of a portfolio that people say is safe uh no 
Should you really still be in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds when annuities and life insurance have beat them over the last 18 years? Uh, no. Someone has an addiction, and I'm sorry to be the guy in your life that tells you you have cancer, but either you or your advisor is addicted to the stock market if you're still using stocks, bonds, and mutual funds when they've performed so poorly for 18 years, even though we've had one of the longest run-ups, I think the longest run-up of all time, from 2008 until now, and yet you're still putting money in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds when annuities and life insurance that have zero downside potential, the no-risk strategies, often no fees either, have significantly outperformed stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, yet your addiction to stocks, bonds, and mutual funds makes you continue to give money to somebody and pay for risk with a side of fees? I don't mean to be judgmental. I just, risk used to equal more reward. And now risk equals less reward than no risk. So why would anybody be risking money? As I said, I'm 46 years old. I've got plenty of time, 20, 30 years until I retire. And I don't have a single dollar in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. And is that because I'm anti-stock bonds and mutual funds? Of course not. I have a Series 65 license. I can manage securities. I'm an investment advisor. If I were talking to you in the 80s or 90s when stocks were making 13.5%, I'd be saying you need to use asset allocation. We need to diversify. We need to be in the market because that's what's paying the most. But people, because I'm not Satan and because I'm not a liar and because I have done the research... I'm not putting money in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds because they do not pay well over the last 18 years, period. Why do you think nobody's been willing to debate me in two and a half years of my being obnoxious in everybody's face, challenging them to a debate as a contrarian, calling them liars? Why do you think nobody has showed up ever in two and a half years on this show and you don't see how many downloads I get I do a lot of people hear this I get the emails a lot of advisors listen to this I get the hate mail a lot of people are upset with me and yet they don't show up to debate me or to argue their point in front of you and why is that why do you think that is there's only one reason I mean, if somebody said gravity isn't true and things actually fly towards the sky and if you challenge me, you know, or they invited me to come on the show or on TV and challenge them, I'd just show up and drop a bunch of things. I'd drop a heavy weight. I'd drop something less heavy. I'd drop a feather. I'd go, look, gravity always, you know, pulls things towards the earth. You are wrong. I am right. But these guys, these snake oil salesmen, these conniving, immoral, demonic people who lurk in the dark to sell you stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, even with two and a half years of my prodding, my begging, my inviting them to show up on the show and try to argue why risk with the side of fees beats guaranteed income or guaranteed no losses, or no fees, no losses, half of the gains, or tax-free growth that's averaged 7, 8, 9%, why don't they show up to argue why their, quote, truth, you should put money in the market, works? Guys, there's only one answer, and you know this. Because it doesn't work, it hasn't worked, they are liars, they are immoral, they are ignorant, and they know it. Why do they run with their tail between their legs from my invitation to debate me rather than run towards it like Michael Jordan would have done in his heyday if he challenged him to a one-on-one, -on -one, a game of one-on-one -on -one basketball? Because they know they'll lose. Why is this important to you? If they won't debate me to argue their stance, you know that they're wrong. And you know that I'm right. 2 plus 2 is always 4. If Hitler says 2 plus 2 is 4, I don't like Hitler. You shouldn't like Hitler. He's a bad man. 
But if he says 2 plus 2 is 4, we have to say he is right. And if Mother Teresa says 2 plus 2 is 5, I like Mother Teresa. I think she did great things. We respect her. You should too. But if she says 2 plus 2 is 5, we must have the personal strength and character to disagree with her and say, you are wrong. And I'm telling you, the entire reason I started this podcast is because the industry is one big, gigantic Mother Teresa that looks good, has done some good things, has earned some respect, and then is lying to you. The industry does not tell the truth. Blah, blah, blah. Let me get off of that soapbox before I, I don't know, get too clean. Who knows? I don't know what the problem with being on a soapbox for too long is, but I, maybe I get too clean. Here's two ways you can get other people to pay for your long-term care instead of you. Because if you don't do this, you just put a bunch of money in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. You got a million bucks. You're taking $50,000 a year out of it, blah, blah, blah. The fact that you're going to run out of money before you die, we'll ignore that for now. It's a big deal, but we'll ignore it for now that you'll run out of money before you die. Most likely if you're taking 5% out of an account that goes up and down, blah, blah, blah. All of a sudden, you're doing that. Let's say there's a million dollars left in the account and you hit a long-term care snafu. One of you gets Alzheimer's. There's no health insurance that covers Alzheimer's. So you have to go into long-term care. You can't do two of the six activities of daily living, feeding yourself, transporting yourself, uh, toileting by yourself, things like that. All of a sudden, one of you triggers eight, $9,000 a month of expenses. Well, 8,000 times 10, that's 80. There's 12 months in a year, so that's another 16 grand. So you're $96,000 a year. How fast do you think you're going to go through your million-dollar portfolio if you're taking out $96,000 a year to pay for medical expenses or a long-term care facility or a, someone to come into your home? Now, you might still be taking out the $50,000 a year to pay your expenses too, or maybe some of your expenses are down because you're not going to movies or going out to bars or whatever. But you know, $96,000 to $120,000, $130,000 a year Depending on market performance, you've got, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten years left before your portfolio is gone. Or you live two, three, four years, waste most of it, and then die, and then your spouse has nothing left in the account or the nest egg to take care of them. It's not a wise way to do it. Using your own money to pay for long term care expenses like nursing home and bringing somebody into your home or, um, uh, any type of care, foreign you know, care in other countries, things like that, it's not the best way to do it. There are two strategies that I really like that I want you to understand. One of them is double income from income annuities. The other one is what's called accelerated death benefit or using the, using the death benefit of a life insurance policy while you're still alive. Let's cover double income first because it's pretty easy to understand. I have said over and over again that annuities are not investments, or at least income annuities. Income annuities are not investments. They're a purchase. Most of us own a car, and we know that that car is a bad investment. It's not going to appreciate. The car won't be worth more five or ten years from now. It's not the way you leave an inheritance or grow your wealth to own a car. We buy cars because they're convenient and they give us amazing lives of freedom to be able to go wherever we want to. An annuity is the same way. You don't purchase an annuity. If you give $500,000 to an insurance company, you're not purchasing an annuity saying, I think my $500,000 is gonna grow to six, seven, eight hundred thousand by the time I die. At least this is true of income annuities, growth annuities are different. But you don't buy an income annuity thinking that your 500000 is going to appreciate. You buy it because you've purchased a farm, a money tree. You own a farm that kicks off dollar bills. You own a money tree that every month you say, I give you five hundred grand, And every month you give me $25,000, $30,000, no matter what. And if I die, my family gets the $500,000 back? That's awesome. I get $25,000, $30,000 a year, and if my $500,000 runs out, if I live long enough and run out of money, you guys are going to pay me out of your pocket? I love that. That's a purchase. That's not an investment. It's not about future gains. That's about creating or buying for yourself an amazing life. That's what income annuities are. Well, guess what? If you buy the right income annuity, 
by the way, one of them is proprietary. You can only get it through someone like me, who's a part of an elite group of only about 850 agents in the entire country that are allowed to offer it. So you can't get it from your local agent. Some annuities, the insurance company that backs them says this. If you give us $500,000 and we're paying you, let's say $25,000 a year, and you trigger long-term care, meaning you have to go to a long-term care facility or bring someone into your home, we will double the $25,000 a year to $50,000 a year for up to five years. One company even had a tripler for a while. Maybe they're still around. Double or triple income if you go into long-term care to help you pay for medical expenses with OPM, other people's money, awesome sauce. I love it. I love that. So that's my first favorite strategy. So when I'm setting up a financial plan or my team is doing it for you, and we're going to take your assets and split them up into the three types of money you need in case accounts, income accounts, and increase accounts, the income account, which is often an income annuity, a purchase of a paycheck, we're often going to suggest that if you need, if you have sick life of the five lives of retirement, long life, short life, rough life, sick life, and the next life, if you experience a sick life, we would prefer that you have a company that will double your guaranteed income for up to five years to help you to pay for that, not out of your pocket, but out of their pocket. Booyah! Love that. The second tool, and I'll stop after this, the second tool that I like applies to in-case accounts and increase accounts. You may know that I tend to use insurance companies, our whole company does, instead of stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, not because we have anything against stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. In the 70s and 80s, CDs paid well, and then they stopped. In the 90s, the market paid well, and now it has stopped. In the 2000s and the 2010s, insurance companies have paid well, and we will change again. If bank CD rates go back up to 8 or 10%, I'm not going to be talking about annuities and life insurance because I'm honest and I'm not a criminal. I'm going to talk about whatever of the three places, bank products, the market, insurance products, whatever of the three places is paying well, I'm going to suggest on these podcasts right now, the market and banks are not doing well and insurance companies are paying well. So that's my focus for in-case accounts and increase accounts, your emergency fund and your growth money. I use insurance policies. They're designed differently in, in case accounts have to have no penalties so you can get the money out without any penalty, you know, in an emergency. And increase accounts have penalties. They're long-term investments if you bail out in the first two, three, four years, but they grow completely tax-free. They've averaged amazing amounts like 7 to 10 percent. Both of those, because they are life insurance products, can come with, with what's called an accelerated death benefit. Sorry, that's technical accelerated death benefit let's say it this way you have two hundred fifty thousand dollars sitting in a you know you you received an inheritance or it's sitting in the bank or you sold a house or it's money you've saved up that's not in an ira so it's in a brokerage account whatever it is you have two hundred fifty thousand dollars of your assets that's not in an ira my team comes along and says let's put that inside of a cash value life insurance policy built to be a cop car built to be a crown victoria police interceptor model you know better than everything on the market that just crushes the stock market and earns tax-free returns we're going to put fifty thousand a year in over five years eventually you get the two hundred fifty thousand dollars in there but the minimum death benefit that the irs requires you to have you're putting in 250 grand let's say it's 750 grand i'm just making it up it might be a million if you're younger whatever say it's seven hundred fifty thousand dollars all right you put in your first year's premium, 50 grand. You put in your second year premium, 50 grand. We're slowly transferring this 250. You put in year three, so you've got $150,000 in this thing, and something happens in your life. Now, I have a, I have a grandmother. She was really a step-grandmother, but I have a step-grandmother who crashed her bike, hit her head, and then got Alzheimer's and never got rid of it. She lost her memory. She had Alzheimer's from there on. You never know what's going to happen. It doesn't have to be old age that does this to you. But let's say you put in three years of premium, 50, 50, 50. Got $150,000 in this thing. The death benefit is seven fifty. Boom. You need care. You can't take care of yourself anymore for whatever reason. 
these policies, the way they work, they say, if you need long-term care while you're still alive. See, the reason people hate life insurance <clears throat> is because you can't use it until you're dead. You buy this huge policy with a death benefit, and you have to die before anybody uses it, so you don't see it, and nobody loves it, right? This is life insurance you can use while you're alive, and that's what we use for in-case accounts and income account or increased accounts. If you trigger the need for long-term care, while you're alive, they say, I understand you've only put in $150,000, but the death benefit is $750,000. That's what we'll pay somebody if you died. And if you trigger long-term care while you're still alive, you're allowed to spend the $750,000 of insurance company money on nursing homes and care instead of only the $150,000 that you put in. If you put $150,000 in stocks, money, mutual funds, that's all you get. But with life insurance companies, there's an accelerator. There's an expander. It multiplies. They say, here's what we were going to give you if you died. If you're sick, you can have it to pay to get better. And you don't even have to go to the United States-based nursing homes. You can find, if you have a certain type of cancer, and you find out that France or <clears throat> Zimbabwe, for God's sakes, has the highest rate of curing that cancer, you can accelerate the death benefit, get the money, and pay for whatever care you want. So I'm going to wrap this up. But my two favorite strategies, you know, I'm not a fan of saying, put everything in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds and hope for the best. And if you're sick, just pay out of your own pocket and try not to run out of money. But if you do, your family can live on the streets. That's not a good financial plan. I like to use other people's money. For your income accounts, let's get double income if you trigger long-term care. By the way, if you're married, one of you has a 70% chance of going into long-term care. So I'm not talking about something that just a few people experience. This is the majority. Investing is always about probabilities. The probability that you die slowly and fade out rather than drop dead is very, very high. So we need to plan for the worst and hope for the best. That's what financial planning is. It is not a financial plan to sell you stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, and everybody crosses their fingers and go, I sure hope it works out, and your advisor's playing golf. That's called criminal behavior. A financial plan is we've planned for long life, short life, rough life, sick life, and the next life. Sick life, what I want you to have is double income from your annuities if you need to go to long-term care, and I want you to have an accelerated death benefit, a chunk of money that's three, four, five times the amount of money that you even have that you can spend to pay for medical expenses and preserve that estate for the remaining spouse when you die or for loved ones when you finally pass into the next life, which is the fifth life of the five lives of retirement. Hopefully this is helpful for you. It's just a rant. I've been choking and coughing the entire time. I'm going to have to edit this a lot. But the reason I do this, even when I'm playing injured and sick, show must go on. Thank you, Freddie Mercury. The reason I do this is because I think you people are the best. Ciao, ciao, ciao. Renovate. Retirement. With Charlie Jewett. That's all, folks.